Hi, I'm Kelly Mailer. Welcome to my shop in Berea. It's a small town, but a great craft center in eastern Kentucky. I've been making furniture here for about 14 years, mostly custom, one-of-a-kind pieces, like this small cherry table and this federal secretary that I've just started on. Sometimes people come in here and say, boy, if I had machinery like this, I'd really be able to do good work. I suppose they think by having bigger and better machinery, that's all you need to become a good craftsman. And I suppose that's understandable. These days, with high-tech tools that provide most of the labor for us, it seems that we don't need as much skill to operate the tools. So you might look at a saw like this as some kind of automatic wood processor that you just plug it in, watch your fingers, and it'll do all the work that you need. But if we don't come to the tool with skills equal to it, we're actually going to end up with cuts that aren't square, burn our wood, make cuts that aren't straight, and worse yet, we could even hurt ourselves just as easily on this saw as any other tool. Now this may look like a great big saw to you, but really it's just outfeed tables in the front and the side that go around the saw, which is about the same size as any other 10 inch saw, which is what it is. Now this is a little heavier duty, it's a three horsepower saw, which I need for the business that I'm running. It has a three horsepower, three phase motor enclosed in a metal base that also catches the sawdust for when I'm cutting wood. I've hooked up a little wooden uh, knee switch here so I can turn it off easily with my hands free. I try and think of it as a power assisted hand tool. Really it won't do anything for me unless I come to it skillful in the way that I stand at it, the way that I feed it my work, the way that I sharpen it and maintain it. These are all skills that are based on solid techniques. Techniques I hope we can show you in this videotape and its accompanying book. Now I've borrowed a smaller and less expensive saw to show you that you can really do good work even on a modest tool. Actually there's not a whole lot of parts to a table saw, believe it or not. Uh, basically we have a top with an opening for the saw blade to come through. We have the body which houses the innards um, for the saw blade and all. Uh, the top is about one of the most important parts of the saw in that it's, it needs to be good and flat. It's usually a cast iron material. There's an opening cut out where the saw blade comes up and a throw plate will fit in here. And these are miter gauge slots that are milled in the surface parallel to these slots. Underneath, you may be surprised, is there really not that much to it? First of all, we have the trunnions and they're bolted onto the underside of the top. Uh, there's a back trunnion and a front trunnion, and basically they hold up the cradle assembly, which is an assembly that goes from each trunnion. On the cradle assembly is the arbor. The arbor assembly has the saw arbor, which is basically a rod suspended by two bearings. On one side we have a flange and nut, and the saw blade goes on here and protrudes through the top. On the other end we have the pulley, and this is connected to the fan belt and to the motor. The whole cradle assembly tilts back and forth, and when it tilts, the whole arbor assembly goes with it and the blade tilts. What makes it tilt is a worm and rack gear, and when you get to the end of this gear, there's an adjusting nut to stop you at 90 degrees. There's also another worm and rack gear for the arbor assembly, and it goes up and down and uh, gives your blade height. And basically, that's all there is to it under here. This 10-inch Delta contractor saw is a mid-price machine, constructed very much like other manufacturer's saws in its class. What we'll do here to tune it, operate it, and maintain it, you can apply to a wide range of other table saws. The one and a half horsepower motor is attached by means of uh, bullet catch. This system allows the motor to move up and down. The weight of the motor keeps the V-belt in tension even when you're raising and lowering the saw blade. The on-off switch is passed through the body of the saw where it sticks out in the front of the saw where you can have easy access to it. It's held on by a small nut. This plastic cover keeps your fingers or any loose objects from being pinched or caught between the pulley and the belt. It's nice to have an outlet box right on the saw where you can have an easy disconnect from your power source. The stamped steel extension tables get put on loosely now. We'll adjust them later. 
as well as the front and back guide rails for the fence. And lastly, the guard and splitter assembly is attached. You don't even want to think about running the saw without it. And we'll fill in the gaping hole in the tabletop with our red metal throat plate. Now let's just take a second to rearrange the shop. Now we've moved this saw over here and the stand is still pretty loose. I left it that way on purpose so that it would level itself automatically despite any irregularities in the floor. I've added wooden pads to the legs to protect the floor when I move the saw around. Now the next thing you want to check is the flatness of our working surface. It's not going to do us much good if we've got this going on when we try to make a cut. We're going to end up with bad results. Now the extension tables are still loose because as I tighten them, I need to be checking for flatness all the way across the surface. To do that, I use a long flat board as a reference to the level of the central cast tabletop. Then I raise or lower the side extensions and tighten them so that they stay right at that level. The fence rail also helps stabilize the edges of the extension tables and to keep them level. I want the throat plate flush with the top, so I'm adjusting the set screws while checking the level with the combination square. Well, our miter gauge slots are for the miter gauge. And basically, the miter gauge fits in here and travels along the slot. It helps you to guide wood through the blade at an angle. Here, it's supposedly at 90 degrees. You can loosen it up and turn it so that it cuts at a multitude of angles. It's made out of a soft die cast metal that's attached to this metal bar, steel bar. And pivots here in this screw. Mostly what I'm concerned about right now in our tune-up procedure is how well that it fits in the slot. It's not going to do us much good, as a matter of fact, here, that it's this loose when we're trying to get a precise cut. We don't want it to be moving around. One way to remove this play is by using a center punch and a hammer. By making a depression in the side of the bar, you will actually raise the metal up around it. I put one dimple at the front and one at the back. You can actually see or feel the, uh, the raised metal. Here I've got it a little bit tight. All you need to do is take a smooth file and remove some of the metal until you get a good fit. Much better. Now if you look in old woodworking textbooks under table saw, you're not going to find anything because originally the table saw was called a circular saw and that's really the heart of the invention. You install the blade by removing the nut and flange from the saw arbor. Position the saw teeth so that they are facing you. The top of the blade will rotate toward you. The saw doesn't cut very well going backwards. Replace the flange. Generally the threads are left-handed for safety and the nut has a flat side that goes toward the blade. By cupping your fingers beneath the arbor, you can catch the nut if it slips. The nut only needs to be tightened slightly as the rotation of the arbor will keep the nut tight to the blade. Replace the guard and the throat plate and we are ready for the next step in our tune-up. If the miter gauge is to cross cut accurately, the blade has to be perfectly parallel to the miter gauge slots. Here is the way I test for this. Raise the blade as high as it will go. Use a clamp and a block with a V-shaped notch in it to secure a long dowel to the miter gauge. You want to make sure your switch is always off before you plug in your saw. Cross cut the dowel continuing past the rear of the blade. When the saw stops and you've disconnected the power cord, rotate the blade. Be careful not to deflect it as you rotate. You'll hear one or two teeth rubbing against the end of the dowel. Mark these teeth with a piece of chalk. Now slide the dowel to the opposite end of the blade and rotate the marked teeth to this position. If the teeth rub here, then your blade's parallel. Otherwise, measure the gap with a feeler gauge.
three thousandths. Let's see, that's a little less than one three hundredths of an inch. So the front of the blade then is a little less than one three hundredths of an inch farther away from the miter slot than the back of the blade. And that's well within the tolerances of woodworking. Now if it were twice that, six thousandths of an inch, I'd become concerned. If I wanted to change it to move the whole assembly so that it was more parallel to the slot, we would go ahead and loosen up the bolts on our trunnions, front and back, and then tap it to line up the blade. Now the next thing we want to check is that the adjustable stop on the carriage assembly stops the blade at exactly 90 degrees to the tabletop. I also want to set the indicator here for the blade angle. I've only really been able to use this for an approximation since the lines are so thick and the uh, indicators are so far apart. You can double check with a bevel gauge and a protractor or a square to make sure that you get the angle that you're looking for. This will get you close to square, but dynamic testing gives you more accurate results. When we flip the cutoff piece 180 degrees and then put the ends back together, any error in the cut will be doubled and easy to see. Now to adjust the blade's 90 degree stop, loosen the lock nut at the end of the gear assembly and turn the adjustment screw in the desired direction. And then continue testing until you get a perfect cut. And that's what you want. By removing the height adjustment wheel, you can get at the screw that loosens the blade angle indicator. Loosen and adjust the pointer to the zero degree mark, and then reset the screw. The 45 and 90 degree stops on the miter gauge are set by means of adjustment screws that limit the rotation of the gauge's body. Even the pointer can be loosened and zeroed out once the stops have been set. But don't just trust the angle markings on the protractor face of the miter gauge body. Find the precise angles dynamically once again. Cross cut a scrap of wood and flip the cut off piece and then snug the two pieces up against the straight edge of the gauge and check the match. Now at the 45 degree stop, do the same test by joining the cutoff piece to make a right angle. Again, any error will be doubled. Luckily, not much here. Another major component of the table saw is the sliding fence. It slides on both the front and the rear rails across the tabletop. The fence gives us a good straight surface in order to guide our wood against as we cut it to width. Of course, we want a straight cut. Also, we want a cut that's parallel to the side that rides against the fence. The best way to achieve this is to have our fence adjusted so that it's almost perfectly parallel to the blade. On this saw, there are three bolts that hold the fence's alignment. This one adjusts the pressure of the J-clamp that holds the fence to the rear guide rail. The two bolts on top of the fence attach it to the cast body that rides the front rail. By loosening these, we free the fence so that we can realign it. Now I raise the blade to its limit and set its distance from the fence at a convenient mark on the rule. Here I'm setting it to three inches. Mark the tooth and then rotate it around to the rear of the blade. And now tap the fence until you have the same three inches. Well, actually, there are two schools of thought on this. One says equal blade to fence distance front and back means blade parallel to fence, and that's perfect. But I like to make the rear blade to fence distance just a tad greater, about a 64th of an inch. This is safer for both me and the work, but more on that in a little bit. One of the last adjustments we need to make on the table saw is to the safety apparatus. It consists of a guard, anti-kickback fingers, and a splitter. Now the splitter needs to be 
in direct line with the blade in order for it to work properly. Uh, this way, in, in the straight line with the blade, you can see that the back of the splitter is out away from the ruler here. There are two slots on the mounting bolt that we can loosen up and bring that over this way and line it up with the blade. The other adjustment is this adjustment. You can see it's out at the top here. It's not square to the table like the blade is. The adjustment for that is under the throat plate where the mounting bracket for this goes. It's got a slotted screw and you can adjust it back and forth until you get it just right. Now let's take a look at these anti-kickback fingers. The way they work, they allow the wood to go under it uh, in, in, as it's being cut, but they keep it from coming back on you in case there's any kickback from the blade. Although I found with these fingers that with smoother wood or closer grain wood, it's not grabbing in at all. And we're all the way out of luck with thinner wood. As a matter of fact, anything under a half an inch, the fingers don't reach it at all. In order to fix this problem, we'd have to knock out this stop pin and, and put it down lower to allow the fingers to travel down further and closer to the tabletop. In order to fix the problem with the smooth wood, I need to take and file my teeth so that they become sharper and grab in better. Now I've had a lot of experience with this type of basket guard. It's the same kind of a guard that came on my larger saw and I've used it before on other saws before that. Even though they do the major thing of keeping your hands away from the blade, I found them to be somewhat inconvenient. One of the inconveniences is the visibility factor. With embossing on the top here, it makes it difficult for, for me to see down uh, and cut, be able to cut to my mark as easily. Another problem I had with it is the, this one here, that, that it, uh, the guard won't stay up on its own accord. Maybe with some ingenuity here I could keep it up, but I never did. This makes it difficult to try and use two hands to get in here and measure back and forth to my fence to blade. One of the last problems I have with this kind of a guard is the difficulty in taking it off and putting it back on. You have to take off the throw plate, undo the bolt uh, under there, and then undo the bolt in the back. Um, and repeat the same operation when you come to bring it back. You have to take off the guard sometimes for operations such as grooving and making dados and some certain kinds of cross cuts and joinery. Now all of these inconveniences don't add up to enough of a reason to risk hurting yourself by working without a guard. But I chose to look for another guard that actually overcomes these inconveniences. It requires a separate splitter, but I really like this guard because it lets me see what I'm working on. It moves out of the way when I need to measure, and when I'm finished, I can pull it right back. Uh, it also comes on and off real easily. Same with the splitter. The splitter's there when I need it with the kickback fingers, and when I don't need it, it's out of the way. Now, all woodworking safety equipment seems to leave something to be desired, and this guard really is no exception. But working without one is like saying, I'll never make a mistake. Now the table saw is a powerful and perfectly safe machine to use with the proper precautions. Otherwise, it really doesn't know the difference between your finger and a piece of wood. So no matter what guard you have, be sure to use it. I have a project here that I've been working on, a maple two-drawer desk. The very next operation we need to perform on the table here is to fit these drawers to the opening. These are my drawer fronts, sides and backs that have been roughed out. You can see here they're oversized. I'm going to need to rip them here, and at this point I'm going to want a very tight fit, which is 2 and 23 30 seconds. Now before we can do any final ripping on the table saw, we have to prepare our stock. We need to prepare a flat face square to a long straight edge. The face rides against the table, good and flat, and the edge rides against the fence. This is a great tool to have around the table saw. A small pocket rule graduated to 60 fourths of an inch. Adjust the distance from the fence to the blade for the desired width. Raise the blade gullets so that they're just above the wood and set the blade guard. Make sure you've got a push stick handy 
Now, these safety precautions I'm taking have become automatic for me with just a little practice. Feed the work slow and steady while standing to the side of the saw. And use your pusher when the end of the work is on the table saw top. You have a nice smooth edge with no burn marks or deep saw grooves in it. The way we were able to attain this edge, if you remember how we set up our fence during tune-up, we moved it out a 64th of an inch. What that means in terms of a cutting action of the saw blade is that the only part of the saw that is cutting the wood is the front part. As it's coming down, it's cutting in the front. As it's passing past the front of the blade, we have a space in the back here, so there's no cutting action going on in the back. There's no reason for the back of the teeth to be touching the wood at all once it's cut in the front. All this is going to do is burn the wood and make deep saw grooves. Also, it means we get very little resistance, which feels real good when you're making your cut. As an added benefit, we're not going to get kickback. Kickback occurs when the workpiece comes in contact with the back of the saws lifted up and thrown at you with great force. Now, setting the fence out a little bit alone doesn't prevent um, kickback because the piece can still creep away from that fence into the saw blade. What prevents kickback there is your splitter. Your splitter will actually keep the piece away from the back of the blade. The only other kind of kickback you can have now is when you have the piece wedged between the fence and the blade. And in this case, the anti-kickback fingers will prevent that from happening. One problem you need to be aware of on a fence system like this is that there's a lot of play, and when we move it to reset it, we can actually clamp it out, either in a toe out or in a toe in position. Now we know from what we've been talking about that a toe in position is going to give us a lot of burn and a kickback possibility. Um, with a toe out position, you know, like so, I'm exaggerating it here, of course. Our cutoff piece is going to be rubbing on the outside of the blade, burning it, and um, we're going to get a lot of resistance in our cut. A way to deal with this problem is that anytime you go to reset your fence, to get in the habit of pushing against it, it's a T system, push on the center of the bar and clamp it down. Just any time that you move it, press on the center of the bar and clamp it down. This should return it to the position that we originally set it at in our tune-up procedure. Let's set up our blade to cut the rest of our sides and backs for our drawers. We have our front, which is already cut to the final width. We'll use it to make our setup. This is a common practice. As a matter of fact, it's the preferred method if you have a piece that's the size you need. Now let's reset the blade height. This is a controversial subject among woodworkers. The answer that I've always liked the best is from a friend that tells his students, how much of your fingers do you want to cut into? In other words, keep the blade height as close to the thickness of the wood as possible. Keep the workpiece against the fence and reach for the pusher as soon as the trailing end of the work makes it to the table. Here you can see the splitter doing its job, keeping the kerf open. The anti-kickback fingers are ready if needed. It's always a good idea to move your waste pieces to the side and to remove them all together when you are finished. Now we've covered fence adjustment, blade height adjustment, and the use of our safety apparatus. There's one other piece of equipment that we need to master before we're going to get good results from our table saw, and that's our body. Just like an athlete, we need to train ourselves to be conscious of our stance and point of concentration as we approach the saw. It's a common mistake when we first go to use a table saw to stand a little too far back. It's understandable, it's a dangerous piece of machinery. But what happens is, is that we end up overreaching as we make our cuts, and this puts us off balance, and this is a dangerous situation. What we want to do is to get up as close to the saw as we can. I actually come in contact with it at, with my foot against the base and my body right up against the rail. This gives my body support, which leaves my arms free for manipulating the work. When I'm ripping, I'm standing to the left of the saw blade, not in line with it. My left hand is pushing my work up against the fence. And this is really where my point of concentration is, where the work meets the fence. My right arm is right in, in uh, line with my workpiece. 
And as you push through, at the end of your cut, you're, it's real natural and you're not off balance at all. Now, of course, with different size stock, you start out in different places. For instance, with a long board or a wide board, you're going to start out in a different place, but you're always going to end up at the same place doing the same thing. Let's set up to cut this shelf, and you'll be able to see a little more closely, as well as how to cut a wide board. First, I'll plug the saw back in. I always like to pull the plug before I make adjustments around the blade. It's also a good habit to remove any parts or debris that you're not currently working with. With the board leaning on the front of the saw, you're free to turn on the power. Elevate your end just a little bit so that the front of the board makes good contact with the table saw top. Walk the board into the blade, guiding it against the fence. And when the back of the board reaches the table, pick up the pusher and finish up using the same stance as you did when cutting shorter pieces. Now anytime you have a board this long, you need some form of support on the outfeed side of your table. For a rule, it's usually about a half inch lower than your tabletop. I've made this sawhorse out of two by fours and some hardware store brackets. It works really quite well for an outfeed support. I got real excited about this support, this roller bearing support that I ordered from a tool catalog. I thought it was really going to do the job well. It's adjustable up and down. But I found what the thing was is that if I didn't have it exactly square to the workpiece, if I had it canted in either direction, it would tend to pull the board away from the fence or into the saw blade as I was trying to make a straight cut. Now for safety, you really need some form of outfeed support on your table saw as a rule rather than an exception when you're trying to cut a long board like this. Just because of the design of the saw, what happens almost on any size piece of work, there's such a short distance between the back of your blade, the end of your cut, and the edge of the table that almost any size piece is going to want to fall off. You're left having to hold it down in order to keep this from happening, as well as reach over your saw blade to get it and the cutoff piece and still bring it back over the saw blade. And that's a dangerous habit to get into even with the guard over the blade. A simple solution is to extend the front of your surface with a work support. A good support surface that'll work on this saw, we've made out of a piece of plywood, a couple of two by fours that will actually attach up under the table on our extensions. When we bolt it on there, it's going to be level with the surface. With just the added 30 inch surface behind the saw, you'll be able to deal with most of the ripping cuts you'll encounter in normal cabinet making. When you need to rip log boards, add some more outfeed support. Here I've just used a shop table covered with plywood and blocked up to the table saw height. Without adequate outfeed support, this board will become very difficult to hold down to the saw table to the point where control is a problem. No problem here. For sheet goods, which are both long and wide, a side support can be added to either side of the saw. The surface is helpful for both ripping the sheet and for supporting the work after it's cut. Now this is something you may want to practice for a while with the blade down. As a matter of fact, it wouldn't be a bad idea to start out with something less than a full sheet of plywood. The problem in handling such a large piece is the distance you are from the blade and the fact that you need to keep it up against the fence in order to get a straight cut. The piece wants to rotate around the blade as the cut is being made. And if we take our normal ripping position with our right hand between the uh, fence and the blade and push, you can see what happens. If we take our left hand trying to hold the work up against the fence, it just compounds the problem. The solution is, is to get around the corner of the stock with our left hand further up the piece and direct our attention uh, pressure right up against the fence behind the blade. We walk the piece toward the saw and as we approach it, we move around the, around the work to our normal ripping position. We still keep our pressure behind the blade up until we're almost completed with the saw cut where we move our hand back still behind the blade and then you finish up the cut. Now that takes care of feeding the work into the saw. Now it's absolutely essential that you have adequate outfeed support at the end of the table to help you support the work after it's being cut. 
Now you can use a helper, a tail off person as they're commonly known, if they thoroughly understand the procedure that's involved. I've asked my son Jason to help us with this demonstration. Jason, if you'd get at the end of the board and support it about the center of where the both pieces are going to be cut off for balance. Now you notice he doesn't grab the piece. We don't want him pulling on it as I'm feeding the work through the saw, which can take me off balance and into the saw, which can especially be dangerous. I'd also don't want him to try and help me guide the work in any way, which this can take it away from the fence into the saw blade. Basically, his only job at this point is to hold the work up, to act as a support as I'm pushing and he's moving back. This 80 tooth cross cut blade helps to minimize tear out in plywood. So does a slot in a custom made throat plate that fits the blade perfectly, but more on that later. Now if I needed this piece to be cut to a precise dimension with a perfectly straight edge, I would first have broken it down to a more manageable size, say a quarter of an inch oversize. The smaller sheet would be a lot easier to handle accurately. If you have to handle some really heavy sheets, one inch plywood or fiberboard, make it easy on yourself and use some in-feed support to hold the sheet at the start of the cut. Ripping thick stock can be slow going on a table saw that is underpowered. As you can see and hear with this 10 quarter slab that I'm ripping chair parts from. The slow feed rate is also causing some wood to burn. If you find yourself cutting a lot of thick or dense stock, you might want to try one of these carbide tip thin kerf blades. Also, if you have a smaller saw, say under two horsepower, this can actually help you. It removes less material. You can see here, it actually makes a kerf that's about a third less than a regular blade, which means it takes that much less power to run it. You'll notice the difference in what, how your motor sounds. Also, you'll notice how easy that it cuts. Now listen to the sound of the motor. It doesn't labor nearly as much as in the first cut, and I can feed more quickly. The motor on this saw is only one and a half horsepower. A little more half sure wouldn't hurt. Some pretty quilted maple. We we're able to run through that pretty quickly because this maple is not as dense as a hard maple. Now if this were harder and denser wood, we'd have to adjust our feed rate. We'd have to slow down and listen to our motor to make sure it wasn't bogging down as we, as we made our ripping cut. You can see here that the blade is just about at its height limit. Now if we have material that is actually thicker than the capacity of our saw, like this piece of cherry here, almost four inches thick, now the way we want to cut this piece is to adjust our saw blade to just a little more than half the thickness of our piece. We adjust our fence just like any other ripping operation. Run it through the blade, listening to our feed rate. Flip it over, put the same side against the fence, and cut it again. That will give us our two pieces that we're looking for. Now don't confuse this operation with something that's much more dangerous. And that's when we take a board and turn it up on its edge saw it down the middle into two more pieces. This is known as resawing. The reason this is dangerous is that when you go to make your cut, what you have is a tall, narrow piece sitting on a small base. Also, you have your blade raised up pretty high. If you rock your piece at all away from the fence into the blade, it's going to be thrown back at you. This is typically a band sawing operation, and uh, even after all the years that I've been using the table saw, it's not something that I would want to do here. If you find yourself in a situation where you need to resaw, See if you can find somebody who has a bandsaw that you can borrow or let them do it for you. It's not unusual to find yourself needing to cut narrow pieces of wood off at the table saw. One way to do this is to move your fence over like this and cut your strip right off the piece of wood. That's okay if you only need one strip, but if you need another one, you have to reset your fence. Another option is to move the fence closer to the blade and make a number of repetitive cuts. The real challenge here, though, is that you have to be able to put pressure right in this alley between the fence and the blade, which can be a dangerous situation. 
Another problem you have whenever you move the fence close to the blade is you run the risk of running into the um, brittle carbide teeth and breaking one off. Of course, you never want to move the fence close to the blade while it's running. A good fix for the fence is to add a piece of wood onto it, an auxiliary fence, that gets screwed on from the back. The plywood or fiber board for the auxiliary fence needs to be perfectly flat. You should also check with a square that this fence sits up at 90 degrees to the saw table. If not, use thin shims between the fences to help with the final adjustment. A rabbet is a necessity for saw chip clearance. Another problem we have in cutting narrow pieces of wood is the opening in the throat plate. If it's any larger on either side of the blade than the piece you're cutting, you have problems. At the beginning of the cut, it can run right into the front of the groove in the throat plate. At the end of the cut, it can drop down into the opening. This particular throat plate was made to accommodate a number of different sized blades and cutting at an angle. We can actually make a throw plate for ourselves that's the same size as our saw blade. After thicknessing the wood and cutting it to width, mark out the profile and cut the pattern with a bandsaw. You can also use a small bow saw or coping saw. I've turned my belt sander on edge to lightly smooth to the lines for final fitting. I like a tight fit so a one inch finger hole is handy for removing the throat plate from its slot in the saw table. A trial fit will leave marks on the insert where additional sanding is necessary. Go slowly until the fit is snug. If you're wondering about this yellow wood, it's very dense Osage orange. I have to relieve the bottom edges to get this to seat properly on my saw. Easing the bottom edge of the hole will make it easier on your finger. To make the saw curve, hold down the insert with a narrow board clamped across its top and clear of the blade. Turn on the saw and raise the blade slowly. Finally, the splitter slot is lined up with the kerf and then cut. Finally, I can cut the narrow pieces. I'll set the fence to a little less than 3 eighths of an inch from the blade. A suspended guard like this one is about the only thing that will protect this sort of cut. Ordinarily, you'd be looking for kickback trouble here. But my quarter inch thin plywood pusher keeps a firm grip on the narrow workpiece, and the splitter keeps the work out of contact with the blade. Now, not everybody has a suspended guard like this. With a stock basket guard, you can see there's no room here for a 3 8 inch cut and a pusher. If you need to cut narrower pieces than this kind of a guard will allow, you can make a little jig like this, which is nothing more than a board with a notch cut out of it and a handle that's been glued and screwed on. What it allows you to do is to move your fence further away from the blade. Your work gets supported by this notch. You adjust it over to the size piece you want, and you can cut off a piece pretty narrow here safely as well. Move the jig along the fence and steady the workpiece with your left hand. Don't press the wood against the blade with your left hand. My hand moves back along the workpiece, pressing it against the jig. I'm handling it very lightly. For ripping thin stock, the correct pusher is all that's necessary. Make the heel depth less than the thickness of the stock. You've noticed my preference for this Volkswagen style pusher. I really like it because of its long nose and that it can hold down your work a long ways up the piece as you're making your ripping cut. The heel you can make different sizes according to the thickness of the piece that you're working with. It's good to make the pusher high enough to keep your hand well above the fence and the blade. I just make these from scrap around the shop. The shape really doesn't matter that much as long as you have a good straight edge along the bottom so you can have equal pressure down your piece. 
Uh, I like to round over the back corner so that way we don't have a sharp corner pushing into your palm. And then the rest of it I sort of lightly sand the edges so I don't get any splinters as I'm using it. Now there's just as many push stick designs as there are woodworkers, but basically they do the same thing. They hold the work down against the table and the fence as well as keeping your hand away from the blade while you're making your cut. Now there's no standard design in push sticks, so I would suggest that you pick one that looks good to you to start with and modify it until you're comfortable. Now if you remember our drawer parts that we cut to their final width before, now need to be cut to length. And when we say cut to length, what we're talking about is cross cutting. Now by cross cutting we mean cutting across the fibers of the wood at 90 degrees to the long straight edge. Now if you've read ahead in the book, you know that we can't do this freehand. We're not going to get a straight cut and it doesn't take much wobbling here for the blade to grab onto the wood and throw it back at us. Now the standard accessory that comes with the table saw is the miter gauge for making this cut. It helps us to hold our wood straight. Although the body is a little bit short, any movement at all here against your gauge is going to cause us not to get a square cut. Now a good fix for that is to add an auxiliary fence to the miter gauge. You can screw this on with the holes already provided by the manufacturer. This will end up giving you much more of a bearing surface to run your piece against when you make your cuts. I'm cutting a notch here only to accommodate the particular guard I'm using. For a basket guard, just make a straight fence that extends past the blade. Again, notice the clearance rabbit at the bottom of the fence. It's a necessity on all fences. Now let's put on the guard and we'll cut a square end off of this piece. This is always the first step in cutting to length. Make one end square. And once you determine that it is truly square, use this end as a reference for measuring the finish length. In this case, I mark right from the drawer opening. From this mark, I'll draw a line across the test piece. When I center this line right at the end of the auxiliary fence that has already been cut with the saw blade, I know that the blade will split the line. Now I could transfer the length from my test piece directly onto each of my drawer fronts and backs here, one on each end. Now even if the pencil marks were exactly the same width, I would still have the further challenge of sawing to the center of each one of these eight marks on my pieces. Now a better way to do this is to set an adjustable stop at the end of my auxiliary fence here that is the exact distance from the end of my workpiece to the blade. Then for each cut that I make, each piece is going to be exactly the same length. I've made a stop that gets clamped to my table. The thing that I like about this stop is that it doesn't get in the way when I make my first squaring cut, but then it's right there to help me cut the piece to length. I can use the test piece to set the stop's distance from the blade, or I could measure with a folding rule. In a moment, you'll see the purpose of this additional board I'm clamping in place. My extra board clamped to the fence sweeps the cutoff ends clear of the blade, where they can't be thrown back at me. For each of these pieces, I first square up one end, and then I put that end up against the stop and cross-cut the piece to length. The drawer's side pieces are too short to reach the outboard stop, so I've glued another stop block to the flip side of my sweep board. You can measure to the blade with a ruler. I like using a metric rule because the arithmetic is a lot easier to do in tenths than in fractions. You can do it on your fingers. And with millimeters, I'm always working with twenty-fifths of an inch, and so I can be very precise. Now these pieces have already been squared and now need only to be cut to length. 
Now the miter gauge is a versatile tool for doing cross cutting on the table saw. But when it comes to cutting, say, small, short pieces, we're going to have a lot of difficulty in handling this work, and also our hands are going to become dangerously close to the blade. With large work, there's so little bearing surface against the miter gauge that it's hard to hold steady for a good square cut. Even with the auxiliary fence, the miter gauge sometimes just doesn't give enough support. A better way to handle these awkward cross cuts is to make two wooden runners to ride in the miter slots. Across these lie a flat piece of plywood to act as a carriage and a couple of boards for fences. Together these make a sliding table jig to carry your work across the saw. To make the jig, first mark the center of the runners on the plywood carriage and drill and countersink the screws to the carriage into the runners while they are sitting in their slots. I like to space them about three inches apart. Position the rear fence along one edge of the plywood carriage. Drill and countersink using longer screws, at least two inches long, and join the carriage to the fence. No glue is necessary. Carefully mark where the saw will come through the carriage. Now, this won't necessarily be at the exact center between the runners. Continue to fasten the carriage to the fence with screws to fall at least a half inch to either side of the blade carriage. After testing the jig, look for any shiny areas in the runners. These will occur where they fit fit too tightly in the slot. Carefully scrape them with a chisel. What you're trying for is a jig that slides easily, but not too easily. You don't want even the slightest bit of side play ruining the accuracy of the jig. With any side play at all, you'll have to replace the rudders. With the jig in the miter slots, carefully cut into the carriage about two-thirds of the way through. Now you can square up the front fence to the line of the cut. Clamp the fence in place and fasten it to the carriage. Be sure to drill oversized screw holes so you can make any minor adjustments that are necessary to the fence's position after you've made your first test pass. Don't forget to make up a guard, which you could easily do with three pieces of plexiglass. After lining up the parts, clamp them together using two-inch spacer blocks to help hold the assembly together. Then run some acrylic adhesive between the joints for an almost instant bond. The large housing block glued to the front fence will keep the blade from being dangerously exposed at the end of the cut. Glue it in line with the blade saw curve. Paste wax on the runners in the bottom of the carriage make for a smoother pushing action. The guard rides in two shallow quarter inch grooves cut into the front and rear fences. For a test cut, Use a wide board to help you judge more easily any out of squareness in the front fence. Well, that's unbelievable. I don't believe I've ever gotten it square on the very first try. Matter of fact, sometimes it's taken me an hour or two to get the um, fence perfectly square with the blade. But with oversized holes in the plywood, by loosening them up, we can maneuver this around until we get it just right. And even if it takes a while, once we get it, we know that we can depend on it to be square for the cuts that we make. And about the little piece that we talked about at the miter gauge, let's see how easily we can cut it here and be safe at the same time. Not only did it cut it easily, but I can keep bisecting these tiny cutoffs safely and accurately until there's almost nothing left. If we're going to do repetitive cutting on a jig like this, all that's really necessary is to set a stop along your back wall, put a clamp on it. Now I'm sure that once you start using a crosscut box, the miter gauge will become obsolete in your shop. Cross-cutting is so much easier when the workpiece is carried and supported through the cutting process. Then it's cut to length. Now if you want to do pieces that are much longer than the back piece of your jig, really all you need to do is just add an extension. I usually use a piece of stable mahogany. Two clamps really hold it better. <laughs> 
And then you can just take a block anywhere along this, uh, an extension, to the length that you want to cut. And it's the same procedure over again. One end square, and then over to the stop. Now this piece is only a few feet long, but you could also extend the stop much further if necessary. Now there are limits to what a sliding table and a saw this size can do, but I don't think we've reached it here yet with this 20 inch piece of mahogany that probably weighs about 60 pounds and is 2 inches thick. Now, I'm not always cutting pieces like this, but there are times when I need to cut chest sides and desk tops and large kinds of case good pieces. The clamp block helps hold down the heavy chunk of mahogany. This table is just a bigger version of the smaller table that we just used. Now, even though the saw is having a hard time grinding through this dense mahogany, the jig is still easy to push the work is being cut off square. 